welcome everyone. And uh, this event here is organized by the European Debate Initiative, and we are a group of European young people who uh, who studied European studies and different uh, majors, and we thought it, it's really interesting to invite uh, speakers such as uh, you today as a politician and also expert people from NGOs, um, could be ministers, could be diplomats, a lot of different people to kind of discuss European issues and, and create dialogue between young people, citizens, and then uh, policymakers and, and so on. Um, and we're really happy that you could join us today. Um, and recently we came across uh, Hannah's uh, interview in The Guardian and that really uh, sparked our interest. We were very impressed by, by your work and visions as a, as a young M uh, MP in Estonia, the, the youngest one actually. And we thought it would be really inspiring and interesting for us and other young Europeans to be able to to hear about your journey and uh, and your story, basically, and what motivates you. Uh, so we're really happy and honored to welcome you today. And thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, for the audience, we encourage you to ask questions along the way. So it's going to work in the way uh, how we usually do it is you write them in the chat and then you can uh, ask them yourself. Or if you're not comfortable, we can also ask them for you. But we'll give you the floor, basically, and take them into the conversation. And a quick introduction uh, to you and your biography, which you can supplement afterwards. Uh, so Hannah is a member of parliament in Estonia, and you joined uh, at 23 years old already, uh, representing the Liberal uh, Reform Party of the Prime Minister uh, Kaya Kalas, and you work in the Environmental Committee. And um, so prior experience has been in the banking sector, is real estate, public policy, a lot of NGOs, and like climate activism as well. Um, and you've started political initiatives in your party with sustainable thinking. Uh, you're also a former youth delegate to COP, um, and uh, your first big victory as a, uh, as an MP was within the first month of the election and uh, leading the fight for legislating uh, marriage uh, equality. And then Estonia went on to become the first of the first uh, ex-Soviet countries to legalize same-sex marriages, which is uh, quite groundbreaking in this legislation. And this came into effect in January this year. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, it would be great if you would like to uh, to to give us a few words about uh, well your who you are and uh, if there's anything we'd like to add, and then we'll come and in, dive into the discussions about first uh, Ukraine and security and the future of Europe, and afterwards we'll dive into climate policies and your journey there. So uh, over to you, Hannah. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't know if I have anything to add, maybe um, that I also work in the EU Affairs Committee. So this is a committee that um, replaces the plenary hall for EU questions and uh, you can belong in there, but also your uh, priority committee, so to say. So I work with both environment and EU affairs, which uh, uh, gives me this full view of, of how things are going with the Green Deal as well in Europe and, and energy and, and everything. So. I think I have a pretty broad view, um, but coming to the um, article that uh, where I was featured in, in, in The Guardian, um, I have to say I didn't lead the fight to marriage equality. This was a priority of our coalition. So in politics, you never do anything alone. And I think it was maybe the um, editor's translation of, of some kind, but I definitely didn't lead that alone. Uh, if there was this one big leader, it was the Minister of uh, Social Defense here in Estonia, and she's also in my party. So uh, I think the credit goes, uh, goes to her and uh, also the coalition. Well, that's that's kind of to, to elaborate on. And, and thanks you also for, for adding those details. Um, and I think uh, our motivation, at least to to speak to you and, and our audience, is really to hear about how, what it means to be a, a not just a young politician, but but basically having been into the NGO sector and being an activist and then going into as a policymaker. Uh, but then I think uh, Francesca, unless you is your internet okay? Yes. Um, then let's dive straight into the perspectives on Estonia and Europe and and the future in in terms of security, Ukraine, and many other things. Yes, so then I'll take over. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I wanted to give just a brief uh, maybe introduction to Estonia for our guests today who, who don't know much about your country and then also ask you about yeah what it's like to be in Estonia and the political and geopolitical perspectives that might differ from the 
old Western Europe. Um, so Estonia is a small country bordering Russia of just 1.3 million inhabitants, um, and which has been under Soviet occupation for half a century and is today in a very, um, let's put it, maybe challenging situation because you have a big neighbor that has been a very aggressive towards other bordering countries. I mean, the war in Georgia in 2008, but also in Ukraine since 2014, and now the big, big war since 2022. And uh, Russia has been repeatedly threatening also the Baltic states and Estonia being one of them. So maybe to start with the question, um, because in your interview in The Guardian, you said it matters to everyone who is in Estonia how things turn are going to turn out in Ukraine. So maybe to explain to people who haven't been to your country, so what's, what's the strategy in Estonia how to deal with this current threat and, and how have you experienced the last two years also as an activist and politician? Um, yes, thank you. Um, it, it's definitely um, very hard, very emotional for all Estonians. Um, I was born in uh, 99, so I was born in free Estonia already. I've had the, the goods of uh, belonging to the EU, to NATO, so I've pretty much grown up with, with everything good and, and with peace. And now, two years ago, when Russia started its full-scale war in Ukraine, um, I find it hard to believe that we're seeing this now in the 21st century, but uh, it just means that Russia hasn't changed at all. Um, no matter the leader, they um, they want to occupy, they want to threaten, uh, they want to um, gain as much power as possible in, in every means. And the reason why it's so emotional for Estonians is because we were occupied as well, as you said. And um, even though I wasn't born at that time, um, I still have the imprint of it. Uh, there are still people referring to it as, as the Soviet time. Uh, you know, older people keep telling us how it was back then. This is sort of why some people are maybe um, not believing that much in the EU, because some people even like the way things were. I don't want to, um, you know, say anything positive about Russia, but it has had a big impact on our society. Also, the uh, integration part, uh, we have uh, many Russian speaking people uh, living here in Estonia. In Tallinn, there is this one district where um, most uh, people living in there only speak Russian. And because we were occupied and we were left with th that heritage, so to say, uh, it's still today possible in Estonia to live as a Russian and not know any Estonian at all. And this is the reason why we are starting to do this education reform. Uh, we don't have any Russian schools. All of them need to go um, only Estonian uh, for this fall. And I mean, yes, we had 30 years, but, um, you know, uh, Russian speaking people and Russians, they're uh, part of our society. We can't just overrule them. So it's a very... Um, socially, um, you know, careful topic as well uh, that, to deal with. But um, the reason, the reason that we're the, the biggest supporters of Ukraine is because um, not only uh, does Estonia's future depend on whether Ukraine wins this war or not, but Europe in general, because uh, we've seen Putin say that uh, he wants to regain the area that Russia used to have even though they didn't, they occupied free countries. And, uh, you know, we see this uh, in, in Ukraine, they, they do everything uh, they possibly can, and even more we can imagine, to, uh, to win the war. And, and this is why supporting Ukraine is even more important. And it might start with the border countries, but in the end, we, we might be in, in the Third World War. So it's, uh, it's not a qu question about believing in something. Um, there's this um, good or in a way, bad documentary, uh, 20 Days in Mariupol. Um, I highly suggest you to watch it if you're maybe somehow still skeptical of what's happening in Ukraine or, or skeptical about Russia's intentions. Um, this, is, this is horrible what they're doing and they're not stopping before uh, Ukraine either backs down or wins this war. And looking at the future, I, I think there's no way uh, Ukraine should back down and they should win with their terms so giving back uh or, or taking back their uh independence uh taking back uh, crimea 
and um, in Donbass as well. Um, so there's a lot to do. And I, I mean, two years, uh, it's been a long time, but uh, we just saw, I think it was last month when Macron said that all of us need to support Ukraine more. He was very vocal about this, very straightforward. It has been two years and, you know, things like this should have happened a long time ago, but uh, we can't take the time back. And uh, as people who support Ukraine, our job and countries, uh, our job is to talk to this about other member countries as well. Um, I know that bigger countries, I mean, Estonia is relatively a, a small country, bigger countries have many of their own issues they deal with and supporting Ukraine is not the top priority. But uh, if we talk about um, belonging to NATO, then uh, you know you have to fill your 2% of GDP uh, goal uh, for defense expenses, but we see that most countries aren't filling it. And uh, it's a sad thing to see because here in Estonia, um, our percentage uh, for defense expenses, it's over 3%. And for this, we had to uh, raise the taxes as well and, and do adjustments in our national budget. So we're really doing everything we can within our country as well. And, and there's no reason other countries shouldn't do it if they care about the future of the EU. No, I think you, you make a very important and strong point saying that it's not just Estonia which is threatened, but actually, yeah, the whole of the EU. Oh, yeah, this is just a map for those <laughs> who don't know to just show the border that Estonia has with Russia. So it's uh, you're pretty, pretty close uh, geographically. Um, so maybe to, to, to follow up on what you just said that, you know, this awareness that you have to speak to other member states and to also convey the importance of of, I mean, the outcome of the war for whole, the whole of Europe. What, what, what would you say needs to happen so that war, you know, doesn't expand? And what would you tell politicians in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, um, the, on, on this topic? Like, what would your message be for those who maybe don't realize as much as, as you do? Um, it's a good question. We're always thinking of new ways how to do it. But uh, one way to advocate for uh, Ukraine's win is, is just, first of all, saying that all of our future uh, depends on this, no matter whether you're a small or a big country in the EU. But uh, also, there are so many ties within our, um, I mean, the European Union, uh, economical and so on. And uh, if one country is affected, then it, no matter where you live in the EU, you will be uh, later on as well. It's just a matter of time. So uh, it's a question of whether you want to act now or whether you want to act later with bigger consequences and the bigger pay. And maybe going into so NATO, what is, you, can't, you briefly mentioned NATO in your introduction, but how central is NATO to your country? And, and when Europeans discuss the future of NATO, it's it's sometimes in a in a sense that it's not very concrete, but for you it is extremely concrete, as we see we saw on the the border map, um, a sort of existential question, no? Um, yes, I mean um, I think for for you in in general, uh, everything that we've gotten since you know we joined NATO and the EU, the the free market, um, the defense, just being allies in general. Uh, it's very important and, and especially important, uh, obviously, for uh, countries that share a border with uh, an aggressor state. But uh, I think it's important for all of us, not just Estonia. And, uh, you know, we have to build our defense up ourselves, too. We cannot uh, stop acting and, and just, uh, you know, believe that our allies will come and, and fix everything if something happens. Our mission is to not make anything happen. I mean, in terms of war. And, uh, you know, this can only happen if Ukraine wins the war. Yeah, exactly. And I think, in at least in some other European countries, the, the debate about NATO is like, either it's the EU or it's NATO. And, and But what we don't realize, or maybe some don't realize, is that it's, it's always going to be both. And right now it is very clearly NATO and that's probably what you see every day in, in in your reality that we maybe see less of in the the further the further away we get from the Russian border. Yes, but uh, if you look at uh, Estonia's other neighbors, for example, Sweden and Finland, who were sort of neutral before, then it's a clear 
change in the state of mind of, of Sweden and Finland as well, the, because they joined NATO, they see that Russia is a threat and we need to, uh, we need to partner up with uh, as many allies as possible and with, you know, in means of every sense. So uh, it, it's just logical, I think. And now um, the, the sea that is between all of us, it's a sort of like uh, Lake NATO. So uh, I, I think it's only a good thing, the more protected we are and, and the more just secure we feel uh, together. Yeah, maybe to take on that, uh, because the NATO discussion, I mean, now of the next general secretary has been quite dominant. And this year it's the 75th anniversary as well. Um, but of course, Estonia, like many other um, countries in Central Eastern Europe, joined in 2004. And since then, this has been kind of the guarantee or security guarantee so far. I mean, as a deterrent uh, factor for Russia. Now, you mentioned Finland, and I think this is very interesting because both, as you said, it was neutral, but now with the new full-scale war of aggression, they decided to join this military alliance, defensive alliance. And what would you say compared to Finland, which is very prepared, I think one of the most prepared countries after Ukraine, maybe in terms of military um, preparedness, how, how would you compare Estonia to Finland? I mean, how is the society preparing for defense and how would you say there are similarities um yes and no i've talked to my friends in finland and uh, they say obviously when russia started its full-scale war in ukraine uh the state of mind of many people changed uh before they had many ties uh with russia in means of business and in estonia there are still also companies that have ties Obviously, uh, we're trying to here in, in the parliament advocate for all of them to be cut off. But uh, in, in business, uh, you know, you have, I don't know, long term contracts and whatever. Uh, I know you can bring these up as excuses, but uh, we do what we can. And uh, the same is in Finland. Um, but before that, they were before uh, Russia started its war in Ukraine, they were a bit more skeptical or maybe even skeptical, a part of their society. That's why, uh, what I can tell from uh, from the stories of my friends. But here in Estonia, we've never undermined uh, Russia in that way. We be, Because we, we know the history, um, th there's no way that uh, they've changed to a democratic country, as, as they say they have. I mean, uh, when we look at the act, uh, they performed a cult uh, elections. Um, you know, it, it's not possible uh, to call yourself a free democratic country if you're running things like this. So uh, uh, Finnish people were more skeptical now. I, I, I don't think they are. But I asked uh, my colleagues from the Finnish parliament um, if uh, the defense question is going to um, come up in the upcoming EU elections as well. And they said no. And I thought, like, why not? And they said, it's because we all support Ukraine. And uh, I think most likely it's, it's the same case here in Estonia. I mean, politically, uh, there are a few parties, um, ECRE specifically, which is the far right populist party, uh, who say that we have been supporting Ukraine too much and we need to, you know, save this money for our own people. We have our own issues. But uh, what parties like ECRA and other parties like these don't see is the long term view is, you know, we have to make these expenses right now for us to be safe later. So. Um, so, yeah. And yeah, I, I mean, I think, oh, sorry. sorry, if I can quickly follow up on what you mentioned here in the if, in the debate in the parliament. So what are maybe some some interesting like differences? Because you mentioned that it's there's a very strong uh, support for Ukraine uh, across the population, across parliament. Um, but what are kind of the tensions going on? You mentioned the also Russian speaking minority. Uh, are there voices that that are saying uh, diverting things? And how do you how is that playing out in the public and national debate on, on support for Ukraine? Maybe also on the European level. So what Europe should do, what Europe not should do and so on. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I just wanted to add to um, something I said before that uh, you, you said it was 75 years of NATO just recently, uh, just two or three weeks ago uh, for Estonia, it was 75 years of the first deportations. So uh, if you look at the history uh, with, you know, these parallel timelines of, of 
what happened when, then uh, you really see uh, where the Baltic states, for example, were at the time when, you know, other countries in Europe started to build allies, for example, or, or you know, did their own things. Uh, that's one thing. But when it comes to the media, um, I think, um, you know, we, we have these separate, um, how do I say, not columns, but these even bigger uh, like many outlets inside of every media outlet that uh, broadcast everything that is happening in Ukraine. Uh, the parliamentarians here, we get uh, daily info on what's going on. And uh, I mean, the the party ECRA that I talked about, they're probably the most, um, the, like the biggest cause of why some part of the society is starting to get this like war fatigue. Uh, or, or are starting to question uh, whether we should support Ukraine or not, because uh, you know the, the money that we're providing for the support is not coming just out of thin air. I, as I said, we had to raise our taxes, uh, we took a loan, and uh, we made these cuts in the pu public sector, but uh, these aren't all related to war. Uh, our uh, national budget wasn't in a... In a uh, good place and it still isn't but uh, you know if you add up all of the taxes and everything it might seem a lot to the society and uh, definitely it's it's um, hard for some part of the society because you know as regular humans we decide everything with our wallets and with our comfort so if anything makes you uncomfortable it's sort of hard to focus on the problems happening outside your home so uh, this comes down to the climate change as well which we can talk about later but um I understand why they're feeling this way, but in general, I would say the support for Ukraine hasn't faded. Uh, it's just that, you know, we really want this war to be over on Ukraine's terms. And uh, and um, it's um, something that I think is causing um, these very, very hardly advocating uh, Estonians to, to get this sort of fatigue, not war fatigue, but advocating fatigue, is that we keep telling uh, bigger countries in EU to support Ukraine more and to, you know, reach their even 2% target in the NATO uh, in means of defense uh, expenses. But uh, it, it doesn't happen. So uh, our question is, as I said before, you know, to think about always what, what should we do next in order for the bigger countries to, to realize uh, the danger the same way. So maybe that. Yeah, maybe to take on on that because i mean you're, you're right to say that uh estonia has like increased you know increased your taxes and for the spending and in 2022 you were actually uh, for gdp per capita the biggest supporter of ukraine although you're such a small country so i mean you are kind of the the, the example prime example of europe of how things should do and how much our security should be worth you know worth for us all I think you're right. The challenge is to communicate this so that also bigger countries actually realize. Um, maybe just one point on what you said with the deportation starting 75 years ago for like the audience in total, 10 percent of, you know, the pop population in the Baltics were deported um, by the Soviets. So that's like 200,000 people. So it's something that's very strongly ingrained, of course, in, in, in the history of the country, even your prime minister has family, her mom, who was deported to Siberia. So this is like the part the part of history that many are not aware in the West. And I think that also explains why you are so much aware of, you know, where Russia is standing and, and what kind of danger or threat it can be. Um, maybe as a final question before we go on to the next topic of, of climate change, um, how, I mean, what what do you hope because we, we talked about the challenges that European countries don't realize what is needed. Um, what should happen to your mind, like so that in the next 20 years, war becomes, you know, unthinkable in Estonia, but also in the whole of Europe? That's also a very good question. I have to say it doesn't only come down to Europe, but um, if um, you talk about Russia, or if you're referring to Russia, then uh, first of all, Ukraine needs to win the war. So then Russia will back down. They will see that there's no point of messing with uh, with the EU countries, even though uh, Ukraine isn't in the EU. But we have, um, you know, st uh, started uh, 
a long time ago the enlargement uh you know process um so so just i think russia needs to know that there's no point of uh, messing with the eu but uh there are more sanctions we can do uh th there are more um just these um legal things we can do in the end it would be uh it would be the end goal if putin and war criminals um other war criminals in russia would go to court um and uh you know we we have these legal i don't know these these uh terms in english but we have these legal uh ways of um taking um how do i put this um you mean the frozen assets or yes the frozen assets sorry we we keep saying this in estonian all the time so i forgot but uh we need to do this as well uh we just need to gain uh, the support of bigger countries and you know come to a consensus this cannot only be something that estonia advocates for as a small country but uh, i'm really thankful that uh, gaia galas is being listened to and uh you know if we can do it in estonia with 1.3 million population then bigger countries should have no problems with raising their uh defense expenses and supporting ukraine in any way they can because uh you know it, then it comes down only to uh, the, the matter of priorities and and if we look at it this way we look at the values and priorities then uh, the picture becomes quite sad but um I would say Ukraine Ukraine needs to win first and then then we can see what we can do with Russia but I think this will be um like this first bigger step for Putin to understand that what he has done is wrong and not only that he doesn't just need to understand it he must pay for it because uh what he's doing uh, is costing uh, is costing Ukraine uh, lives and, and not just soldiers uh, kids and, and uh, women and you know it, it's just war crimes they're doing it's not just the, the war itself and obviously there's so much damage to Ukraine's infrastructure um, uh, environment uh, you know it, it's a big and, and horrible picture and there's no way that you know he can just get out of this like uh, in a simple way no and I think the point you said Ukraine must win the war I just saw in the chat that we have a question uh, can Ukraine win the war and I think I mean it's a question that's asked a lot by skeptics in in the west you know why should we support is this even feasible what would your answer be to to this Well um if you're spending the time on debating on this then you're losing time that you should use for supporting Ukraine. So if all of these countries that are still skeptical or are not supporting Ukraine as much as they can, then, uh, you know, that's already a problem, I think. And I'm just being very bold. There's no way to, you know, tiptoe over this issue. Um, bigger countries just need to do more in the EU and that's all. No, thanks a lot. Thanks for the, <laughs> the honest answer. Then I'll go over to Zoe so we can... Yes, the next we'll, uh, we'll dive into climate policies, but and thanks for that last point. I mean, you have to put it boldly, probably, because less talking, more doing is is sometimes all we need in politics. But now over to something quite different, but also we chose this topic, so cli the climate crisis, because it's one of the roots of, of your work, not just as a member of parliament, but also uh, your background before your political career. And uh, a quote from this uh, interview in The Guardian, I just wanted to to mention to set the scene and quote start is the climate crisis remains a muted topic in Estonia, largely thanks to a deep rooted car loving culture at odds with Tallinn's much lauded free public transportation for residents. So just um, uh, uh, one quote, uh, end quote there uh, from this interview. And so for everyone uh, to know, so you started your career as a climate activist, actually, and before that was before you ran to parliament. And you have been at COP. You have been uh, um, one of the 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 people that act advocating for policy policymakers to make a change uh, for climate policies in Estonia and also for for Europe and and globally, of course. So maybe uh, briefly on your what are you what were your motivations and what what are your motivations to go into politics and work on this issue, going from a civil society side into the policy one, and. Then now that you've been in policy, politics for a little bit, what um, have been some places where you can make an impact and maybe also where is, are places that is difficult to make an impact as a politician? 
I I would start from the very beginning. So um, I grew up in the countryside. I have a good connection with nature, even though I feel like it's sometimes disconnecting due to me living here in Thailand, where almost half of our population lives. Um, but I have a good connection with nature. I went vegetarian when I was 10 or 11, something like this. So I've always cared really deeply for the nature, our environment, the animals. And I think I just got it with me from home. So in, in that sense, um, I'm just really with my work trying to preserve everything good that we have here in Estonia. And I find that um, it's both funny and sad at the same time. Uh, we as Estonians, we like to think of ourselves as these nature loving people. But uh, when it comes to climate policy um, and, uh, you know, funding different climate initiatives, uh, this is very polarizing uh, in Estonia. So I feel like um, even though we, we have nine months of um, not so good weather, uh, we still really appreciate uh, the four seasons we have, our weather, our nature. Uh, almost every Estonian has like a countryside home they go to uh, to spend their summers and uh, you know we, we really are close to nature but uh, it's hard for us uh, at this latitude uh, to to understand the impacts of climate change because uh, we don't have to deal with it daily um, when I look at the broadcast for this week uh, on Friday I think they promise it will be 21 degrees that's crazy for April but uh, what our news are saying is that uh, we we have uh, early summer, you know. So uh, the society in general, I mean, in some ways they don't have to understand climate change because this is a topic that politicians should deal with on a national and global level. But uh, I think we're uh, underestimating the the threat uh, of of climate change. And um, when it comes to the car culture, then I'm mostly talking about uh, cities. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, we had this historic win in the Thailand City Council, where um, we took down the previous mayor. He belonged to the or he belongs to the center party, which they're sort of um, in the gray area with supporting Ukraine. And there are many Russian speaking uh, politicians in there, and they have been running Thailand for over uh 15 years so almost 20 years and they have built this you know narrative that um thailand is built like a tie so um not not that long tie but the bow tie and uh, it's hard to um build our infrastructure in a environmentally friendly way and uh, you know we need cars to get from point a to point b and the situation is better in Tartu which is our second biggest city but here in Tallinn um, it's just you know I'm being honest if I say that it's more comfortable to go from point a to point b by a car rather than by public transportation or or by foot and the reason is not because people are lazy but the it's just a system that we have built here. So uh, we're currently in the middle of uh, new coalition talks. I think they will um, sign the new deal within a few weeks and uh, the center party is now left in the opposition. So um, so we'll see uh, what's, what's going to happen. Obviously, you know, to redo infrastructure, it takes many years, but uh, we have to start from cities, not just in uh, Estonia, but in means of Europe altogether and the world as well, if we want to you know, deal with the car loving uh, culture. Um, but I, I think it goes maybe for the people that, um, you know, were born in the Soviet times and grew up th there. And now they're adults in, in free Estonia, in democratic free Estonia. Um, maybe, I don't know, they're, you know, compensating for something that they didn't have when we were occupied. I've noticed this, but um, my generation, we're not really that much car loving. I, I do take taxi quite a lot, but I don't have a personal car. So I don't have any, you know, physical things standing anywhere that just takes up space. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. And it's very interesting to to get to know this this national context that not many uh, are aware of. And what were the main differences then? So going from being a climate activist and, and going and advocating for change uh, towards policymakers and then being a policymaker yourself, and, and uh, you've already uh, started many initiatives to kind of advance this sustainable thinking 
uh, in in parliament and th uh, throughout the political uh, spectrum but you started as a as a, a youth delegate and as a youth activist so what has been like the main uh, changes or maybe even things you were stunned upon that were harder than you thought or how is it being uh, going from activist to policymaker or do you still view yourself as activist as well can you combine those two um definitely uh but i would even say that i was a political activist more than i was um uh, sort of a real climate activist i think all um the credit goes to the activists who are actually standing in in cold and hot uh, weather with their um you know um signs and and so uh, i did that too for uh, for a few times but i've been very heavily advocating here in the political scene for, for most of my uh, professional life because uh, when I was a youth activist or I worked in the private sector, so for, yeah, for example in banking, I noticed that the um, uh, civil society uh, and, and so I would say the third sector, so to say, and the private sector, they are way ahead in means of changes. Uh, they do everything they can. They do new in initiatives. Um, you know, in the private sector, you have this competition advantage uh, if you're clean if you're green uh, if you want to um, you know be sustainable uh, but uh, in politics everything is just really slow and uh, in the end you know the private sector the businesses and civil society they can only do so much but here in the parliament these 101 people who are pressing the button for different decisions they are the ones who are deciding so I felt like um I felt a lot of uh, youth washing as well, for example, when going to different events for youth in Europe, um, you know, you uh, are there for like two or three days or even more, or maybe a week, you draft up these policy papers. And I know now that they're not ending up anywhere. It's just, you know, to include youth or whatever they say, but it doesn't actually mean anything. And so all of these things combined made me really angry. And, uh, you know, looking at, um, what scientists have been saying from the, I don't know, last century, uh, what's going on with our climate and, you know, what are the real ways we can fix it? They're not some utopian ways. They're right here in front of us. I, I was just really uh, mad at the system and I felt like, you know, I need to do something that creates bigger change. I can advocate for something in, in the third sector, in the private sector, but in the end, if the decision makers are here and they don't care for it, then you know my work is just going down the drain. So um, I started from the local levels uh, in uh, 2021. I ran here in Tallinn, in Kristina uh, district, and uh, my platform only consisted of climate and environment uh, related topics. I think I had like three promises, like new bike lanes, uh, a climate act for our district, and um, I don't know, something else, all related to climate and environment. And I thought to myself, um, everyone else is talking about, you know, other things, maybe I should do the same and just leave out the climate or an environment or, you know, um, put it to my platform on a smaller scale. But uh, I figured, uh, you know, even if I get just two votes and one of them is mine, then, you know, I still stay true to myself and uh, and I'm advocating for the right things. And I got uh, 187 votes, which is quite a lot for a no one. I, I literally, I didn't know anyone. I just started. I didn't even know what I was, you know, going to do after the elections. I just wanted to use it as a platform to get my message out. And the same thing happened last year 2023 when it was our parliament elections i also thought i was going to get two votes for only advocating for climate i had three promises so one is uh, for estonia to have a climate law this we are drafting right now the second is boost our renewables we're doing this right now and the third of all is uh, promoting um, environmental and climate education which i'm doing now in the parliament so very realistic things but i thought people wouldn't be uh too appreciative of this because you know when it's the national level election you have to talk about pension you have to talk about education defense especially uh in means of the current situation but i just only talked about climate and environment and i ended up getting 1050 votes so you know coming from the local elections the jump in means of votes has been really high but i think um, my success story is just about staying true to my values and actually you know, providing something else to the political scene here in Estonia, something that 
when I was younger, I would have wanted to vote for. Because when I was younger, I went to high school or middle school. Um, here in Estonia, you can vote um, on the local elections if you're 16 and run at 18. For uh, the EP and national level, it's um, 18 and 21. So I was able actually to go to vote when I was in, I think, middle school already, but I didn't go. And I didn't go to vote after high school when it was the national elections. I was 18, I was able to, but I didn't go. And it was because no one talked about climate, environment. There were no women, no young people, at least not in my area. So I figured, you know, if I really want to do this, I want to go to politics, I want to be the sort of candidate that I would vote for, uh, you know, going back in time. So this has been my motivation. And um, here in the parliament now, I do see that, you know, some processes are really slow, but um, we are a democratic country, a parliamentary, uh, country, so uh, we really need to debate on things. But uh, I think I came to politics in a very right time um, because uh, we have this most progressive and most liberal coalition Estonia has ever had in its history. And we have a really good coalition. We have the same values, you know, talking about marriage equality, for example. This is something we did within the first months of, uh, you know, getting elected. And uh, the same goes for climate. No one uh, of, of uh, here, you know, from our coalition is, is doubting whether, I don't know, climate change is real or whether we should do something, nothing like this. You know, we're just all for the green reforms. We're doing this. We formed the Ministry of Climate. We have a good Minister of Climate. We're advocating this in, in all parties and we're drafting the climate law. But uh, when it comes to the, um, uh, you know, slow pace of, of how we do the legislation. Then, for example, with the climate law, we have been getting criticism that we do this too fast. But then again, the more we debate, uh, the more time we're losing. And it's not just, um, you know, beneficial for us in the long run. Also, the entrepreneurs, businesses, they need this investment security. So with this climate law, we're going to provide these um in between targets, uh, targets for the sectors, uh, you know, this is something we've been really missing. And uh, and uh, I think all of the um, green and environment uh, and climate related things we've been doing really fast uh, because we just had elections uh, um, a little bit more than a year ago. So uh, I think we're going on a, on a steady pace, um, maybe even a fast pace. We have this good goal for 2030 for 100% of our electricity to be from renewables. Uh, we're halfway there almost. So uh, I think we're doing good. And obviously there's so much more you can do, uh, but uh, I'm actually finishing my master's in environmental management this spring. So after uh, I've done that, I've got my degree, then I will be just full on focusing on work and, and doing everything else I can possibly. No, great. I mean, it seems like you have a lot, a lot Lot of issues uh, to deal with so on, on, on the climate issue uh, maybe to for those who are not as much expert to to give us a sense of where Europe is standing or where Estonia is standing because we have this new green deal in Europe and all 27 member states agree to become climate neutral by 2050 and to reduce emissions by by 2030 so in the next six years by 55 percent how would you or like, what would your advice be for people who are not, you know, experts in the issue, not dealing with it, to understand the the topic where we are standing and what what needs to happen? Maybe what would your message be? So, first of all, maybe coming down to the Paris Agreement, which also sets at least all EU countries these specific goals. Um, I think we've globally agreed to be climate neutral for 2050 for at least um, countries that have joined the Paris Agreement. But from there on, um, you know, the Paris Agreement hasn't been legally binding for, for most of it. So all of our countries, we had to do the things ourselves. Um, in Estonia, for example, we have uh, the... Mm, how do I put this? So uh, the need to protect nature and uh, align our uh, economy with the nature in the constitution. There are two paragraphs on it, actually. The constitution, which is, you know, the, the most important document in, in our uh, country. But uh, we're not following through with this because they're too abstract. And so I think it's a good thing that uh, EU... 
uh, as uh, one of you know these uh, biggest um, I don't know how to call it uh, unions in in the world uh, that we have uh, followed through and accepted uh, th this one you know pathway we're taking, but uh, it doesn't provide. Um, the legislation inside all, all of our countries. So we have different things coming from the commission, obviously, uh, doesn't matter related to transport or energy or waste um, or just uh, climate uh, you know, targets in general, but uh, we need to do the work in our member states to actually reach the goal. And there are countries that have been more ambitious than others. For example, talking about my neighbors here, um, I think, um, Finland has promised to go climate neutral by 2035 already, Sweden by 2040. So they're even more ambitious than EU. I think 2050 is an okay goal if we start acting now. But if we look at the emissions year by year, we see that they're increasing. And if you look at the news year by year, you see that the climate crisis is escalating all the time. Even though we are you know, making some changes, they're still not enough. And what we should do in our member states here, um, there are you know concrete statistics on this, but the biggest polluters or the sectors that are these, you know, in Estonia we say low hanging apples that we can pick first, uh, it's energy, it's transportation, and um, then it's waste, for example. So um, these big sectors that we can deal with, uh, we have the solutions, we have renewables, I know many countries are nuclear or are thinking about the same with Estonia. Um, in transportation, you know, you focus on the cities, you reduce the amount of cars, uh, you go more electric. Uh, in means of waste, you have to create a system that is comfortable for the citizens. Um, just so many things you can do in agriculture as well. I mean, I think the solutions are there, it's just a question of how fast we're implementing them and obviously it you know costs a lot to do these changes but we have been rolling with the you know same things for um i don't know almost 100 years so it's really hard to imagine a different future but uh, if we don't act now it will cost us much more later and um uh, something that um i think is sad i mean looking at the eu as well is is how uh, political climate change and, and climate policy in, in general is we have agreed on many things you know Paris Agreement we have climate laws in our countries we have the EU Green Deal but um, as soon as the coalition changes or we have the elections um, you know there's always this uh, you know people are afraid of maybe uh, the new coalition especially if it's like a far far right wing party populist party they're going to turn things around and uh, we sort of see this in Sweden as well. Uh, their uh, Minister of Climate has been getting a lot of um, a lot of um, criticism. I just spoke to the head of their um, climate panel, which is um, you know doing the uh, after care of their climate law, and they said that they just published a report saying that Sweden's emissions are um, rising. So uh, you know the countries that we have been looking up to, Scandinavian countries, for example, also Netherlands. Um, we see that their emissions are increasing as well. So now that puts us into a question of what will happen when the new European Parliament and Commission uh, are getting elected. You know, where are we going with this? And uh, it's uh, it's sort of a hard question. I think uh, when von der Leyen, uh, you know, proposed the Green Deal Act, we were all, you know, really like. Uh, rooting for it. It was uh, really needed, but uh, we see now that there's really no one that's super happy about this. So almost no sector, uh, not activists, not farmers, everyone is protesting. So, uh, you know, to go on from there, I think it's quite hard. I don't think the Green Deal is being, I don't know, taking back, uh, being taken back, but, uh, you know, we still, um, you know, need to think of a fair and inclusive way on, on how to uh, implement this. Because uh, if we don't do this, uh, if we just see different, directives uh, that are not being inclusive coming from Brussels to the member states, then the polarization regarding all of the climate and, and green and environment topics, it's just going to get a lot more wider. So so you would say that the problem, well, first you said it's important because implementation in the end depends on the member states. So whatever Sweden does or Estonia does will change the emissions of your own countries. And then of course, in, in the EU as a whole, but then you also say that the legislation coming from Brussels is not always 
as you would wish it to be. Did I get that correctly? Mm -hmm. So that means that it that you hope it would be more inclusive than what is being proposed. I think it's a very mutual thing of, you know, for example, when the commission comes out with something new, they have to already think about the differences of member states. But um, I understand it's very hard to do running the machine that the EU is. It's, it's very hard. I cannot imagine what it's like to be a decision maker there. But, uh, you know, it's mutual because when you think of all the MEPs that work in the European Parliament, they have been elected there uh, to um, represent the interests of their you know, country. So um, mm -hmm. if there's a country that, for example, Estonia, uh, we had this case with Lulusev that we aren't happy about. And and later on, um, you know, all of the media was, was full of like questions of who let this through? What happened? Well, it, I don't know, members of the EU Affairs Committee, you know, the ones that get to control our positions. Sorry, or, which, which law was that? Maybe uh, it was uh, something to do with uh, land use and uh, just Lulusev in general. Uh, we, we didn't get the terms we wanted. But so not in the EU Affairs Committee. Uh, you know, we have seven MEPs. I know that's uh, a little, but still, you know, we have to rely on uh, these different resources we have as a country. And if you're not uh, protecting uh, your needs, uh, then, uh, you know, who are you going to point at? It's, um, it's a very mutual thing. And uh, being inside the EU machine, it's... Um, it's it's hard, but uh, you know this is a question for the new uh, commissioners and the and the parliamentarians. Exactly. Okay, great. <laughs> and as you said, there's a an election coming up in, in June, and and it's actually interesting because we usually think of uh, the European Parliament as like the most progressive or ambitious uh, or other synonyms of the EU institutions and that whole framework. But there was a study um, by a think tank, uh, the think tank Europe, that showed that actually on climate and on uh, nature and, and these areas, actually, it was not that much more ambitious than, for example, the commission proposals and sometimes even watered them down. So usually we have kind of the the, the countries so the, where the council with all the ministers, they usually make it less ambitious than the commission proposal, but we even have in some areas of, of climate and energy and, and uh, nature uh, protection, we have a European Parliament that even in its composition now is is not always uh, proposing more and um, more ambition target ambitious targets. But then maybe uh, as a uh, the same second to last question, because uh, you also spoke about the European Affairs Committee. So in so in national parliaments, uh, there usually is a as European Affairs Committee that's kind of controlling the the um, the position of each government on different uh, EU agenda. So that could be, uh, let's say, uh, climate legislation that's going to be uh, talked about in the EU. So in the Council and in the Parliament, and then each national government goes back to their national parliament, ask, "This is our position. Do you agree with it, or do you have something to add?" So you sitting in 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 participating in that committee, maybe just a, briefly a few words on what are the dynamics there and. Do you feel that 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 is kind of helping to uh, boost the um, the the proposal ambitions, or is it going the other way around? Um, I think there needs to be some uh, work done reg regarding the um, cooperation between, for example, the EU Affairs Committee members and the MEPs. Um, I don't know how's it in in your uh, home countries, but here in Estonia we have just as you know regular people when i was in in, in politics as well uh, felt that uh, the people that we have elected to the european parliament they're sort of far away from us so we don't really know you know what they're doing in there we know they create these uh, reports and then you know they're in these committees so the system works sort of the same as it does here in the parliament but what they're actually doing uh, you know they need to communicate it better and, and we need to ask them more. And we also need to strengthen the cooperation between the committee and, uh, and their work in the parliament. So there's a lot to be done. But as an um, MP right now, I can say that uh, the amount of materials that uh, we get in this committee, that we get from Brussels, different directi uh, directives, different initiatives, different... Uh, events where our ministers are going and we have to like uh, propose positions there's so much material it's very very hard to go through sometimes so uh, what we have done here and I think um, every other country has the same uh, system here in the EU is that we have responsible 
um, members who bring a certain topic to their um, main committee uh, to gain opinions. And then we bring this back to the EU Affairs Committee. So, for example, if I work in the Environment Committee, I get assigned this directive on, I don't know, um, the, I don't know, nature preservation, something like this. Uh, then uh, I will take this uh, duty, I will bring this to Environment Committee, I will ask for the members' opinions, and then I will uh, bring their opinions back to the EU Affairs Committee when we also have the um, officials or the ministers over that are going to represent these positions in, in the future events uh, happening in, in Brussels. Um, so, so there's one thing, but um, we have, you know, this good trust between uh, the EU Affairs committee members. So if I work in the environment committee, I'm most likely not dealing with the financial, uh, you know, directives because I need to, you know, put my focus somewhere. If you want to deal with everything and you also have your main committee where you work, then it's just too much. So there's a lot of material, but we have um, distributed everything between ourselves. So I think we have a good system that is working, but yeah, we need to strengthen the co cooperation with, uh, with the European Parliament. Yeah, thanks for, for those reflections. I think it's the same situation in other member states, at least uh, from in my country, Denmark. The workload is, is very large and the collaboration with MEPs not so existing. So that's definitely something to work on in, in all countries, I think. But then here just to briefly finish off, uh, what would be your uh, main message to young Europeans such as ourselves who are interested and maybe feel inspired to go into either politics or advocating for change? It could be on climate, but also... Uh, on on security on Ukraine, uh, whatever their topic may be, what are maybe some some concrete steps that that, that we can take? Uh, because the opportunity of opportunities are vast, but it can also be uh, difficult to navigate as a as a young person wanting to make a change. Definitely, um, I mean in Denmark, for example, you have a good example of Kira Hansen, uh, who is an MEP or. You know, in, in a few months, uh, she, she will also be participating in the elections. Uh, in Estonia, um, there's me, for example. Uh, you can look up other examples from other member states. There are many. We have this good network between us. Um, so first one would be maybe to find a role model, uh, role model in the sector or in the area you want to work in, because um, in Estonia, we have this saying, you don't need to invent a bicycle when there's a ready system already uh, to, you know, to there. Uh, so you don't have to start from the scratch. Um, but what you can do is, is start from the grassroots if you're not ready to run for elections. For example, I started in politics um, from my party's youth organization. And I don't know whether it is the same in your countries, but uh, here in Estonia, all of our at least parliamentary uh, parties, we have this youth organization that is also political, but uh, it doesn't have any obligation. So you don't have to join the party or something like this. You don't have to participate at the official events and, and uh, you don't have to like campaign for anyone. It's just this miniature version of a party with the board, with the uh, uh, secretary general, uh, with head of the board, with committees or working groups. And so you can just get used to the system. So maybe I would start from there. I would find contacts um, from different parties that you might be interested in. And um, looking at June, I would go to vote. And not only this, but I would very heavily communicate about who I'm voting for and why. And I don't know, if you're not going to vote, I don't support that. But if you're not, then, you know, you should be vocal about this too. You should say that, I don't know, your country doesn't have any good candidates that the young people want to support, something like this. But uh, if you have good young candidates, then definitely you need to boost them. You need to collaborate with them. Uh, if you belong to different organizations that could, you know, provide them a platform because um, youth supporting youth is very important. Uh, I've seen this in campaigns. I've seen this happen in my election result that um, older people uh, do support the youth, young people who want to go to politics, but they're not willing to vote for them. So I think it's just us, you know, dealing with this problem. Uh, if you maybe ask your mom and dad whether they would want to vote for a young person, they most likely say, well, if it's you or our relative, I don't know, your brother or sister, then yes. But then you ask, you know, there's this someone out there, a good candidate, but they're super young, like 18, but they're doing a good job advocating for a good thing. Would you vote? 
and they'll be like, um, I don't know. We'll see about this. But so, you know, it's all about the interpersonal connection as well. But if you can't bring that, uh, if you can make it happen, and if you don't want to run yourself, then you can boost the other young candidates and uh, definitely be vocal about who you're going to vote for, because uh, this will, you know, spread in, in your friends group or, or your network in, in general. And in Estonia, we, we boost uh, young candidates with even pictures and, you know, we go to help them do campaigns. Our political youth organizations get together. We meet up, we meet up at different um, campaign events. Uh, we have this good, like, uh, energy between us. So uh, just supporting each other, um, I, I would say that. But I hope maybe someone here wants to run for the European Parliament elections as well. I don't know your backgrounds but it would be super nice. And uh, if you belong to a political organization and you don't want to run yourself, then just help out the candidate that is running because um, the experience you will get from uh, doing a street campaign, uh, it will just provide you with, um, so to say, um, good cut through of the society. You will, you will get insults, but you will also get a lot of praise. So uh, it, it's just a good experience to get. Thank you for that excellent and very inspiring advice. So uh, so go out there and, and engage, I think is the main message. And thank you so much for your time, Hannah, and for sharing your experiences. And it's very inspiring for, for us and other young Europeans to see an example such as yourself where it, it's really possible to, to make a change and keep up the, the engagement and energy that you have. So uh, thank you so much for, for your time and thank you for those who have listened. And uh, we'll be, as mentioned, putting this discussion up online as well to, for us to rewatch and keep be inspired. So thanks a lot from, from us. That's all from us. And uh, we wish everyone a nice evening. Thank you for having me. Bye. Let's keep in touch. Let's thanks keep in a lot. Touch.